13 tips on more effective preaching. First sermon that I preached, I was about 12 years of age. I still remember that sermon. I memorized it. I think it was about two minutes long. I sweated through all my clothes before even I got up to speak that message. I forgot everything I memorized. I kept looking at my notes, even though I couldn't read my notes. And then I sat down. I was terrified. I was scared. I struggled with public speaking or facing crowds for a very long time due to insecurities and because of my physical appearance. Some of you who know my testimony. And with time, the Lord helped me to overcome that with the help of my mentors, with the help of other people and opportunities that I was given. I would like to share with you just some practical tips that you can take your preaching to the next level. I'm not in any way an expert. I'm not in any way an example or a model of amazing preaching. These are some things that I've seen in my life that worked and I believe that every preacher or a person who inspires one day to preach a sermon, to preach something on the stage um, in front of the youth group, conference, uh, church service, you will find this beneficial. Number one, if you don't listen to other preachers, people will not listen to you. In other words, before you start focusing on speaking, you need to develop an art of listening. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ never called His disciples to lead. He called them to follow. They had to learn to follow before they would lead. Jesus taught them to pray. He never taught them how to preach. And so before we go into improving our preaching, I believe every person needs to improve their following Jesus, prayer life, and listening and enriching their own spiritual, um, if I could say spirit and spiritual tank with listening to other people. Now definitely listening to other people should never, sub, should never replace or substitute reading God's Word and listening to the Holy Spirit. And so other people's sermons are supplement. They are not the substitute and they're not the source of our spiritual nourishment. As a preacher, as a pastor, your diet, meaning who you listen to, will change with time and it's okay. Also, be very careful who you listen to. A lot of times there are people who are extremely eloquent, popular and famous. But there's no fruit in their life. There's no fruit of godliness. There's no fruit of supernatural in their life. And just because they teach cool and they're trendy, you might see a similar thing will begin to happen in your life in the sense that you will get an impartation of a very shallow life deposited into you and you will begin to release that in other people. Preaching is an act of impartation. And so you have to watch what you and who you listen to, especially if you want to see results and you want to see the Lord use you, not just for you to run your mouth on the stage. Number two, your spirit is more important than your sermon. People sometimes ask me, you know, how long I prepare for my sermons. Some of my best sermons, they were prepared very shortly because my spirit was prepared more than my sermon. We speak from the abundance of the heart, not from the polished notes. When the messages come from your heart, they will touch the heart. Keep your heart pure. Keep your motives clean. Keep your spirit on fire. I always tell young preachers, Work on your spirit more than you work on your sermon. Why? Because sooner or later, your sermon will hit the head. Your spirit will touch somebody's spirit. It will touch, it, there will be an act of impartation through speaking if it comes from your spirit. If the very thing that you're talking about is something you don't live, it doesn't change you, it didn't transform you, it's just head knowledge, you're just studying it, now you know a few Greek words and you know the doctrine, but it's not alive. It's not on fire in your bones. It will produce exactly the same thing in other people. It will be dull, boring, predictable. Not because God is dull, boring, it's predictable. It's because it doesn't come from your spirit and your heart. And so sometimes if my sermon is not flowing as I'm preparing, I honestly take time and I just go start praying, speak, speaking with God. Why? Because people don't need something new to learn from the Scripture, but they need a fresh manna from God that comes straight from His throne and it usually comes through our spirit. Number three, Microwave messages usually don't change lives. I believe there are microwave and there are oven messages. One is just information, the other is revelation. One cooks in you over time, another is just prepared because you need something to talk about on Sunday. One will impress people, the other one will impact them. Let the message grow in you. Let it cook. 
live it, wrestle with it. Let it be your journey with God and let your message be an extension of that. For pastors who are preaching every week, it becomes harder and there, therefore we develop series and a lot of times, you know, we have great messages and sometimes we have good messages and it's important to allow also other people to speak and it's important to allow the Holy Spirit to grow through us so that our work for God never outgrow His work in us. Sooner or later, the disconnect between what we say and what God does in us will be felt in the shallow changes our preaching will produce. Number four, start with people, not with your latest insight from the Bible. What I mean by that is we always start with the Bible, yes. But when we read the Bible, we get insights we call revelations. Insights sometimes show something amazing in God's Word. Mistake that preachers make is that they preach something new or something for people to say, wow, that's deep. But it doesn't necessarily connect or help in their daily lives. Sermons have to take people from their reality to the revelation of God's Word, God's standard. For that to happen, we as preachers have to start asking, where are our people? Who are we preaching to? What are they going through? What does the Word of God have to say about their situation? Jesus' sermons were practical. Yours should be too. Now I understand I could maybe, I feel the pushback from some people who will say, well, uh, we don't preach concerning what people are going through. We're only preaching Christ. It's true, but what, what, was, what was Christ doing on this earth? Was He just preaching theology? He was preaching the kingdom. It was very practical. It applied to everyday life. What did Christ do after His preaching? He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He cleansed lepers. He multiplied bread. He walked on water. He prophesied. His teachings were simple. The power that followed His preaching was incredible. It changed people's lives. People are like, oh, Jesus preached simple messages. That's why people came around. And Jesus didn't just preach the messages. He also preached and demonstrated the gospel. Number five. Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave sermons. The Holy Spirit anointed Jesus to preach. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will tell us what to say when we need to say something. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit to give us advice and insight and direction on what needs to be shared. And instead of, you know, trying to constantly come up with something new, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to bring what needs to be brought to people and rely on the Spirit of God. He was given to us for that reason. I also encourage preachers, reuse some of your older sermons with a fresh outlook or a fresh insight. Use other people's sermons. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as it's not something that you do every week or you don't develop a habit or you don't study the Word of God and you don't hear what the Lord wants you to speak about. But rely on the Holy Spirit to give you the Word and rely on the Holy Spirit to release that Word with the maximum impact that will touch the hearts of people. Number six, Jesus taught using stories, so should you. Stories and illustrations help to make the truth come alive and make sense to the people. That's why movies are so powerful in this generation. Movie is a story on the screen. The Bible contains a lot of stories of God's miracles. Jesus, Jesus used illustrations and even miracles to teach deeper truths. I use my own stories many times to back up a point. I try to become as, as vulnerable as I can. In using my stories, I try to ask permission of my wife, especially if it involves her. I use other people's stories. I research stories. I use sermonillustrations.com. I buy, I think I have about six or seven different books where I went on Amazon and I typed sermon illustrations and I bought everything that showed up there. And I don't use it as much now as I used to when I was in my younger years. And so I try to use right now a lot of my personal examples to back up whatever that I feel the Lord is trying to say because I wanted there to be no disconnect between the Bible and how the Holy Spirit works it in my life. But stories are huge. Preachers who are afraid to get naked, if I could say, or show different things that God is doing in their life out of the fear of, oh, I'm going to lose my reward. People will misunderstand my motives. I don't want to talk about myself. It's not about talking yourself. It's about having an example of what, how that works in your life. 
And it's important that these illustrations and these stories that you're using, you're not always the hero in them. The biggest mistake is when you're always the hero in every story that you share. The hero has to be God. The hero has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you're a hero and sometimes you're a total loser. But still, share those things. Let people be impacted, not just impressed with how great and strong you are, but also how weak, vulnerable and how honestly, sometimes you're also just like them. Because we're all the same. We're all similar in our struggles. And when we as preachers don't create a gap between the pulpit and the pew, it draws people closer to God and helps them to understand everyone is able to walk with the Lord in their own way. Number seven, know your material. Get familiar with your message. Practice it so that you don't have to look at the notes. You don't want your message to come from the notes but from your spirit. Now, I'm reading my notes right now, so it kind of contradicts my little video. Um, on Sundays when I minister, or when I go to conferences to minister, most of you who ever watch my sermons, you will see that I'm very rarely looking at the notes. Most of the time, I don't look at the notes at all. And I encourage people to have their message not only memorized. I don't memorize my messages. I memorize the main points and I rehearse them enough in my mind that I allow the Holy Spirit after that to pretty much have this like frame of work for the Holy Spirit to use that to add anything else He wants to add during the service and so that I'm not chained or restrained or restricted or limited by my notes. I want the Holy Spirit to have full control and I want Him to have the liberty to add what else He wants to add into my mind at the time instead of sticking to whatever is written. Now I understand some people that is their method and that's fine. But I think that our generation wants to see that what you're talking about comes from your spirit. It comes from the Word of God and you have it in your heart, not just on your notes. Number eight, make your sermons note worthy. Now this is a little uh, uh, preacher three point um, speaking to you right now. I, I personally try to structure my sermons with an introduction, three points and filled with two, three sub points, adding some stories, ending and then usually have some kind of a call to action or some kind of a ministry opportunity afterwards and building the message for an encounter or an experience instead of just a short little prayer and dismissal. And so that is usually my structure. I've seen a lot of young people respond very positively, positively to that. Um, a lot of people, uh, they kind of go all over the place. They don't have a structure, they don't have a flow. Um, they go from one place to another one and that's fine once in a while. But I think sooner or later, especially if you're ministering to young adults and young people, you have to have a certain flow. So with me, like for example, I like to take one story in the Bible and then I break it down to four or five or three, mainly three points and then add little nuggets into it or stories or some quotes or some kind of a illustration or perhaps even um, a video or something that I could really make the message come alive. You know, I know the work of the Holy Spirit is responsible for that, but I also shouldn't be lazy in adding as much creativity and as much of my uh, human aspect to it to make that message come alive. For example, the story about the, the donkey, you know, on the Palms Sunday. I preached about, you know, uh, the Lord wants to use you, about are you a donkey or are you a disciple? And so, you know, it had this whole vision of the ministry there, which was, you know, go and find the donkey, lose the donkey, bring the donkey to me. And Jesus said on the donkey. And so I used it as four points. And, you know, you save people, you deliver people, you disciple people, and then uh, you send them, meaning the Lord sits on them and He uses them. Then I brought a ladder, you know, and that was really, that's already a very illustrative. I actually wanted to bring a donkey on the stage, but that would be very distracting. I, one time I did brought a sheep. One time I brought a pig on the stage. Uh, I brought a casket when I was preaching about um, end of the year service. I brought a casket. Uh, I brought a casket one time when I was doing a sermon about expiration, preparation for your expiration, meaning you have to prepare for your moment of dying and meeting God and eternity. And so, um, so I like to bring different analogies. I recently I preached a message called uh, living in the limbo or sitting on the fence. And, um, and I pretty much had a person build a fence and I sat on the fence during a little bit of that message. It was very impactful, very illustrative and people really received a lot from it. Sometimes if I preached about grapes, you know, I would bring grapes in on the stage and try to eat them during it. Um, or, or different kind of like, if I can think of an analogy, you know, I would bring that up so that, because it really paints 
a hundred a thousand words just one picture is a thousand words and so it's really 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 good i would encourage you to make your message noteworthy and have some points in your messages that are tweetable because our generation is also looking for those jabs you know like those things that could really be memorable um work on that people are like oh well i i, I can't think of anything just don't be lazy okay it requires some work it requires working with the scripture it requires working with your thoughts it requires sometimes pacing back and forth in the room and trying to think of um, also how can this be worded in such a way that it could become memorable how this can be worded in such a way that it could become um, also catchy it could catch the heart and the attention of a person and how can I make you know my points in a way that people can be can remember them afterwards when they read the scriptures they can oh I remember that message it helped me to understand a little bit more of what I'm reading about Number nine, avoid using words like I, God told me, all, or fillers. Um, <clears throat> you know, like some people have these things, I call them parasites. The middle letter of word sin is I. The middle letter of word pride is I. The middle letter of word Lucifer is I. Too much of I in the messages distracts from the Lord. I did this, I did this, I did that, I felt this, this is what I, 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 I. Get your I out of the way. It's not about you, it's about the Lord. And the other part is, and this is mainly in the charismatic circles, God told me, God told me, God told me. Um, when Jesus was fighting the devil in the wilderness, He didn't say God told me, He said it is written. A lot of young people especially don't know the scriptures and they flippingly use the word God told me as though God speaks to them 24-7. Their lives is usually in shambles, there is no fruit in their life. But this extra usage of God told me, God told me, please, I believe in God, God speaks to us, God leads us. But when you're preaching, preach the word. Preach the word. There's nothing wrong with saying what the Lord told you, but if that is all that you're talking about, is everything God told you, God told you, God told you, um, you're not glorifying the word of God. You're glorifying your ability to hear God. And I don't doubt that. But the issue is that Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We live by His Word. We have to come back to His Word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, they will not pass away. We have to draw people back to God's Word, not just to my interpretation or what I heard the Lord say to me. It's very important. And also, I really want to encourage younger people. There's no need to use God told me in front of every revelation or every insight, especially a lot of those God told me, God didn't speak to you. You've read it in the commentary, okay? So you don't need to put God told me in front of it. Now it came alive to you, it makes sense, it grabbed your attention, it was amazing, but God didn't just tell you, okay? You read it in a commentary. And so there's no need to add that in front of every revelation, so to make it seem like you're more spiritual. If you really want to appear more spiritual, let God confirm His message with signs and wonders and people getting saved. The less confirmation you have from the Lord, the more you need to confirm yourself by adding God told me in front of every little cool idea that's browsing in your head. And we have to be very careful that we exalt God's Word instead of exalting our own revelations and our own insights. And there's also the parasites. And I think that some people have the... I think every person has certain parasites. It's um, God like, 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 like. And so watch yourself and then you will find your own parasites and you have to brutally, brutally uproot them from your speeches. They're distracting, they're annoying and these parasites like, um, mm, mm, they're extremely distracting from the, the message and you, you have to remove them. Number 10, speak with your natural voice. Screaming for 50 minutes is not anointing. It's annoying unless you're Isaiah Saldivar. Control your voice and your, your emotions. Have highs and lows in your message. During powerful points, add more fuego, add more fire. But during normal points, speak normally. Give people a break from screaming. Let people respond by saying Amen. I struggle with this because a lot of times what would happen is that I would start preaching and I scream non-stop and I run out of my steam and my voice and everything and then toward the end I'm already like <gasps> and of course I start speaking calmly not because it was calm points but I was screaming a lot. Now let me say again there are people that it comes naturally. I think Isaiah Saldo is the only one I know who can scream non-stop for an hour and a half and um, 
and not lose his train of thought and his veins not popping out and actually people are responding. But most of you, that's not, that's not going to work with you and stuff. So first of all, people are going to be tired emotionally listening to you to scream. And secondly, it allows people to be engaged with you when you give them a little break and when you don't add screaming, yelling, loud voice to points that don't require that. There, there are portions of your speech, your preaching that are they could be spoken with a natural, calm, strong, confident voice. But then there are those points, they are fire. Like, you got to get fired up. I mean, there has to be fire in your eyes. You got to maybe even raise your voice, speed up a little bit and, uh, and lead to that, that and stuff. So I love those moments, you know, let people respond accordingly, get up to their feet, clap, shout, praise God, pray in tongues and get up to the altar, you know, like repent. I mean, whatever the Lord does in, in your setting, but please play this, you know, up and down, fast and slow like and develop this like an art always be in control of your voice don't let your emotion take over you sometimes people get up and you know they share an emotional story they start crying they can't stop crying uh, don't do that control your emotions you're there with the microphone you're leading people don't lose it let emotions come on but but don't let don't let them sweep over you you're a man of faith not a man of feelings or a woman of faith not a woman of feelings and so control your voice and be natural with your voice the problem with many people is sometimes they speak you know from here instead of from their gut instead of from the depth of their spirit and some of us need to learn and we need to get a voice coach to help us speak from within deep from within instead of speaking from our throat because then we will lose our voice quickly and immediately Number 11 is honor the clock. It's better if you're going over time, if the Holy Spirit is moving and people are crying and the move of God is happening. But if you're going over your time and you will not be given more opportunities to speak, it's disrespectful. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is moving, it's okay. But when you're not connecting with people and you keep on dragging, thinking the longer that you will preach, the more chances you will break through, it rarely does help you. It's better to end it and allow the Holy Spirit to take over the altar call. Also, don't ask pastor for five more minutes knowing you're going over time already, putting him in a very weird spot where of course he's not going to say, uh, no, no more five more minutes. That's disrespectful, that's rude and don't ever do that. That's bad. And so honor the clock is very important. Um, you're not there to preach all of your 37 sermons. That's why you have YouTube, podcast, blogs and all of this stuff. You're there to leave them hungry for more and then letting the Lord move and touch and pretty much um, let them have experience with the Lord after the message instead of your message being the only thing where they hear and afterwards you walk away and they don't have the opportunity to respond. Number 12, physical appearance matters. Look sharp, get a haircut, smell good, wear clean clothes, buy a good undershirt so that you don't sweat. Um, Thompson T is the shirts that I use. I used to sweat a lot. Actually, my viral video that went viral, four things that killed the fire of God, I sweated through. I had a, I have a very difficult problem where on the stage I sweat like crazy. Um, when I go to sauna, I sweat like crazy. And so I've tried every trick in the book. None of it helped. But what's been my solution is Thompson T. And they're not paying me to advertise this, but um, I would encourage every preacher to buy Thompson T if you have a problem with sweating on the stage. Stand tall, smile. Remember that God looks at the heart, but you are preaching to the people and they look at your clothes. Don't try to dress to impress, dress to impact. Dress modestly. Don't try to look hot, sexy or cool or modern. My pastor always tells me, dress, class dress classic because you don't know who will be watching you 20 years down the road and so that you don't have to be embarrassed for yourself. It's important to not stay trendy or even stay cool or please understand, people are drawn by the anointing of God, not because you got ripped jeans and not because your chest is showing and stuff. So that's, that's not a, we don't reflect the culture, we reflect the kingdom of God. And sometimes it's best for your clothes not to be a distraction. You don't need to prove to everybody that you are relevant. You are a revolutionary, you are a revivalist, you carry a revelation of God and that's who you are. You're not a stylist. I mean, unless you're some kind of a person, you know, like you're really into clothing and everything. But when you are there, you're representing the kingdom of God. Get everything else out of the way so it's not a distraction. Stage is not a show. 
of your clothing, your style, your ability to match, your ability to buy expensive clothes and everything. That's not the place for that. If you want to do that, open an online account or open or go do for a, a model for a runway. But if you are there, you're showing to Christ. You're pointing to Jesus Christ. I was preaching in one church and I wore a short sleeve uh, for the sermon. I, I did not know. I asked the youth that invited me, you know, what is their dress code? And something that I try to do when I go to churches, I don't impose my dress code on churches. I try to learn and I try to appear in a way that could minister to those people. And so I, drew, I, drew, I dressed um, short sleeve and the bishop of that congregation and that state got extremely offended by that and, you know, told me that he'll, I'll never be invited to his church again. And so, um, and I was never invited again because of that. And so be very respectful to the culture that you are serving in. And your goal is not to convince them that they're wrong and you're right, they're religious and you're somehow a freebie. Um, your goal is to serve people and don't let the clothes be a distraction. Uh, 13, welcome feedback. First, if you can, please rewatch yourself. Don't ask for feedback if you're always going to defend yourself instead of taking the feedback. Now, everyone loves the compliments. Nobody likes the critique. There's a way to deal with both of them. And let me teach you something that helped me. Compliments are like a gum. You chew it and you spit it out. Criticism, though, is also like a gum. You chew it, you take whatever that you need to take out of it and you spit it out. What God says about you is the bread of life. You have to eat it and feed on it. Your identity is not measured by how successful the sermon was and how God moved. Your identity is measured by how much God loves you and His Spirit lives in you. But you cannot grow without not letting the compliments go into your head and not letting the criticism to go into your heart. You have to be mature enough to want to grow more than to be always liked and loved. And in order to grow, we have to welcome critique and we have to be willing to rewatch our own messages and grow through them. Some practical things. I personally like to use physical Bible for reading and also from, for preaching. I try not to bring an iPad on the stage, typically. Because people have an association with the Bible and it really helps when you come with the Bible. I know it's a modern thing to bring an iPad and I, I get all of that. I have an iPad and that I use, but on the stage, I always try to bring a physical Bible and hold a physical Bible, even if I'm not reading from it, but from my notes because of that association with the Bible. I want people to fall in love with the Bible, not with the device, even if I'm all for Bible apps. Um, the other part is my favorite Bible app is Olive Tree Bible app because it allows to have notes inserted in the Bible as you're reading. You can see your own notes. And secondly, it allows you to characterize them, create different tags, different folders for those notes. I buy all of my commentaries there, I buy all of my dictionaries there and other things and when I study the scriptures, I study through that other people use logos, some people use other Bible softwares. For me, my favorite has been Olive Tree. I download good 10-15 uh, commentaries. I don't read all of them all the time but I try to read different ones, especially the ones that contradict each other, just to kind of see each other's points of view concerning different topics. Also, I want to hear from you. What are some of the favorite messages that you heard, and I know this may sound a little bit selfish, from me and why? What are the things that um, make you come back and keep re-watching the content that we put out? Why do you feel like it connects with you? Because I mean, it's obvious, I have an accent. I don't necessarily have the most prettiest face. If I look up, my eye looks up, the other one doesn't look up and stuff. So I want to know from you. I mean, yes, I know it's God's grace, but also some of the practical things that you've noticed that could help me to kind of realize, okay, this is working, this is doing good, keep on doing that. Or some of the things maybe that you really enjoy when preachers do or certain way that they present a message that really sticks and connects with you. Drop that in the comments below. I would love to hear your feedback. Thank you.